Hello, my name is Randy Dumas and I'm an application scientist at Quantum Design. Today I'm going to highlight some of our latest efforts that allow one to probe magnetodynamics at nanosecond and even picosecond timescales. Specifically, I'll be focusing on our broadband ferromagnetic resonance capabilities for the PPMS product line, as well as some of the latest research being performed on Optical, our 7 Tesla magneto-optical cryostat. As an outline, I will discuss and highlight our capabilities as a function of increasing measurement frequency. Starting at the DC limit, we have our vibrating sample magnetometer, or VSM option. Here we are only interested in the length of the magnetic moment vector as a function of static DC magnetic field and or temperature. The VSM is discussed at length in the VSM option webinar, which can be found on our YouTube channel. We've been adding lots of content to our YouTube channel, and I encourage you to check them out. I should also mention our squid-based magnetometer, the MPMS-3, in which one can achieve a sensitivity two orders of magnitude better than that of the PPMS VSM. For completeness, I'll also mention the Nanomoke 3 from Durham Magneto Optics, which operates both as a magnetometer and domain imaging microscope. As the excitation magnetic field frequency increases, we enter the realm of what is typically referred to as an AC susceptibility measurement. In an AC susceptibility measurement, we are interested in how the magnetic moment vector responds to an AC field. For example, the ACMS2 PPMS option operates up to 10 kHz and is discussed at length in our ACMS2 webinar also found on YouTube. AC susceptibility measurements have found great utility in the study of spin glasses, superparamagnetic nanoparticles, and of course superconductors. AC susceptibility measurements up to 1000 Hz are available on the MPMS-3. Note, while not offered for the PPMS product line, AC susceptibility measurements can be performed well into the megahertz range using the Dynomag AC susceptometer which is optimized for studying nanoparticles at room temperature. As the excitation field frequency increases into the gigahertz realm, we are now probing dynamics at nanosecond timescales, as set by the gyromagnetic ratio and can be theoretically modeled by the landau lifshitz gilbert equation. Here the coherent processional dynamics of ferromagnets can be studied. These frequencies also correspond to those associated with the generation of spin waves or magnons. The gigahertz dynamics probed by FMR allow the experimenter to extract several material parameters not accessible by either the VSM or ACMS measurement options. These include the effective magnetization, gyromagnetic ratio, damping parameter, inhomogeneous broadening, and while not directly extracted from the software we offer, our FMR capabilities can also facilitate measurements of the exchange stiffness and inverse spin hall effect. Broadband FMR is primarily of interest to those researchers studying thin magnetic films, whether they be metallic or insulating. The RF excitation fields generated by the coplanar waveguides necessary for broadband excitation are relatively short range, and therefore best suited for thin films. More specifically, research on magnetic recording media is always of high interest. Not only is this true for traditional perpendicular recording media, but also for studies on future heat-assisted and especially microwave-assisted magnetic recording media. While a recorded magnetic bit is intrinsically static, the process of recording that information quickly is intrinsically dynamic and occurs at nanosecond timescales, and is also true for magnetic random access memory devices. Therefore, an understanding of the gigahertz dynamics of such materials is paramount. And finally, the materials utilized for the more fundamental research area focused on functionalizing spin waves, generally termed magnonics, naturally benefits from a knowledge of the aforementioned dynamic properties. Let us now build up a cryo-FMR measurement system from the ground up. Here is a schematic coplanar waveguide along with an RF current source and RF detector, which is essentially an RF diode. Our measurements are performed by analyzing transmission through the coplanar waveguide. The incident microwave current is converted to a DC voltage by the detector. The magnitude of this DC voltage is directly proportional to the transmitted microwave power. Ideally, the sample should be placed here as also shown in this picture. The RF field would then be oriented horizontally, which is important as the DC magnetic field provided by the superconducting solenoid in the PPMS is vertical. Remember, in order to resonantly excite the magnetic moment, the RF field must be perpendicular to the DC field. For our purposes here, the RF frequency will remain fixed and the DC magnetic field is swept. At a particular combination of DC field and RF frequency, 
the sample magnetic moment will precessionally resonate. During the resonance, the sample will therefore absorb some of the RF power, which will therefore not make its way to the RF diode, resulting in a dip in the transmitted power. For those of you familiar with a vector network analyzer, this is analogous to an S21 measurement and is essentially just the DC voltage on the RF diode in our example. As the energy absorbed by the sample is small, so is the corresponding change in voltage. In order to improve the signal to noise, an additional modulation field is supplied by a Helmholtz coil, as also shown here, and the voltage measurement is performed by a lock-in amplifier. The modulation field is on the order of 1 to 10 ersted and, compared to the resonant frequencies of the sample, very slow, typically 490 Hz. In such a field modulated experiment, it is actually the derivative of the absorption response that is measured, as shown in blue. The RF source, RF diode, modulation drive, and lock in amplifier are all included within the spectrometers offered by NANOSC. Here are some example data. The black squares are the measured resonance field, measured up to 40 GHz, of the 10 nanometer thick permaloy test sample that is included with the cryo fMR option. The red line is a fit to the Cattell equation from which the effective magnetization and gyromagnetic ratio can be determined. The frequency dependence of the line width for the same sample is shown here along with a linear fit. The slope is directly proportional to the damping parameter alpha and the y-intercept corresponds to the inhomogeneous broadening. This analysis clearly shows the importance of a broadband measurement as a fixed frequency measurement would not allow for one to determine the slope nor y-intercept. The included software facilitates both measurement setup and data processing to first fit and then extract the aforementioned dynamic material parameters. Let's now move on to some extensions to our FMR capabilities. We will start with measurements of the exchange stiffness via perpendicular standing spin waves. Here is a schematic cross-section of a relatively thick 100 nanometer ferromagnetic film. For a traditional FMR mode, the phase of the oscillating moments through the thickness of the film is uniform, as shown here. Here is a schematic first-order perpendicular standing spin wave mode in which the phase of the oscillation differs by 180 degrees from the top of the film to the bottom. This results in a node at the film center. Such high-order spin wave modes also manifest in a field or frequency sweep as an additional resonance. Here we see a standard field sweat measurement at 9 GHz of a permaloy silver alloy film. The resonance at high fields corresponds to the standard FMR mode and the resonance at lower fields to the first order PSSW mode. Here is a complete measurement spanning 2 to 16 GHz showing the frequency dependence of the resonance fields for the FMR or P equals 0 mode and the first order PSSW or P equals 1 mode. Remember, as a function of field, the FMR mode will occur at a higher field. The FMR mode can be fit using the herring cattell equation to extract the gyromagnetic ratio and effective magnetization. Once the gyromagnetic ratio and effective magnetization have been calculated using the FMR mode, the same equation can be used to fit the P equals 1 PSSW mode to extract the exchange stiffness A. Here is an example from the literature where this analysis was performed on permaloy alloy films to extract the damping, effective magnetization, and exchange stiffness as a function of the atomic percent of platinum, silver, or gold within the permaloy. The goal of this research was to find a way to decrease the magnetization of the film without increasing the damping. Interestingly, the addition of silver was found to decrease the magnetization with only a modest increase in damping as compared to gold or platinum. Another interesting magnetodynamic phenomenon is the inverse spin hull effect. Let me briefly explain some of the physics. Let's start with a ferromagnetic film undergoing resonance at a given in-plane field and RF frequency. Now let's add a second non-magnetic layer, let's say copper. By a process known as spin pumping, a diffusive flow of pure spin current will be pumped into the neighboring non-magnetic material from the ferromagnetic layer. In the case of copper, which is a very long spin diffusion length, not much will happen as the diffusive flow of angular momentum will remain unaltered at the interface. However, for materials which act as a good spin sink, for example palladium, platinum, and many others, a portion of the spin angular momentum will be instead be converted into a transverse charge current by a process known as the inverse spin hall effect, thus establishing a transverse electric field as shown.
which can be measured with a voltmeter. Interestingly, this spin to charge current conversion also acts as an additional damping mechanism, which tends to increase the measured line width of the induced resonance. Central to both of these equations is the effect of spin mixing conductance, which characterizes the efficiency of spin transfer through the ferromagnet non-magnetic interface. As many intrinsic factors can affect the damping, it is generally best to use electrical measurements of this inverse spin hall effect voltage to measure the effective spin mixing conductance. Making electrical contact to the edges or surface of the sample to measure the transverse voltage can be extremely difficult, especially since the surface of the sample must also be in close proximity to the surface of the coplanar waveguide. To facilitate these measurements, a special coplanar waveguide for the cryo-FMR probe was developed, shown here, which incorporates two electrical contact pads in close proximity to the central conductor of the coplanar waveguide. The sample can be simply taped firmly to the coplanar waveguide to ensure electrical contact. The electrical contacts are then integrated into the standard PPMS sample chamber wiring and connected to the inverse spin hall effect BNC connection on the front panel of the Nanosk instrument box. Shown here are the conventional FMR in black and inverse spin hall effect in red response of a permalloy palladium bilayer sample. As the inverse spin hall effect voltage is measured using the same modulation scheme as the conventional FMR response, the curves will look very similar, exhibiting the now familiar derivative response. To quantitatively measure the spin mixing conductance, a quantitative measure of the inverse spin hall effect voltage must be carried out. To accomplish this, we recommend using an external nanovoltmeter. The voltmeter should have an analog voltage output, which is usually located on the back panel. This can then be directly connected to the auxiliary input on the Nanosk instrument front panel. Here's a direct measure of the inverse spin hall effect voltage, this time of a permalloy platinum sample measured at room temperature and 4 GHz. Moving on to other platforms compatible with the spectrometers offered by Nanosk, cryo-FMR measurements can be performed within the much smaller diameter sample chamber of the MPMS-3 via special coplanar waveguides. Both in-plane and out-of-plane measurements are possible. Note for out-of-plane measurements, the maximum sample size is about 2 mm by 4 mm. A further restriction is in regards to inverse spin hall effect measurements, which are not possible with the cryo-FMR probe available for the MPMS-3. Measurements can be performed over the same temperature range as that for the PPMS product line and up to 7 Tesla. Continuing on with cryo-FMR, the Montana Cryo Station can also perform FMR measurements for in- and out-of-plane fields. The temperature range is 10 to 350 Kelvin at fields up to 7,000 Ersted. Also note, the cryo-FMR instrument can also be integrated into other magnetocryostats on the market. If you're interested, please contact your local quantum design office for more information. The phase FMR spectrometer is intended for room temperature applications which use an electromagnet, for example, the one shown here. While the Nanosk instrument cannot energize an electromagnet, it can control a suitable voltage programmable magnet power supply, for example those from KEPCO. In addition, the Nanosk instrument incorporates a closed loop hall sensor to set the desired magnetic field. One stark benefit of a room temperature setup is the ability to easily set applied field angles between 0 and 90 degrees. Finally, a specialized inverse spin hall effect coplanar waveguide also exists for the phase FMR product line. The latest development from Nanosk includes a spectrometer with a 2 to 60 GHz bandwidth, which is currently in the final test stages. On to some resources. The two application notes shown here can be found on our applications page and contain much of what is presented in this webinar. Additionally, the testimonials page on the Nanosk website keeps a running list of publications using the Cryo and Phase FMR systems. If you have any publications that you would like us to highlight, please let us know. This table summarizes the various platforms we offer for broadband FMR. If you'd like to learn more about this capability, please check out our dedicated FMR webinar found on YouTube. I'd be happy to take any questions related to broadband FMR at this time. Back to our outline. Increasing the excitation frequency even farther into the terahertz realm so-called ultra-fast dynamics can be probed, which, for example, allow one to study the exchange interactions fundamental to both antiferromagnets and ferromagnets.
Typically, such excitation fields must be provided by pulsed laser sources and therefore optical access to the sample is typically required. For example, as offered by OptiCool, our cryogen-free 7 Tesla magneto-optical cryostat. The OptiCool allows for easy optical access for tabletop spectroscopy experiments. Much of the early research utilizing OptiCool has been geared towards studying the ultra-fast properties of quantum materials at picosecond timescales. Here's Rick Avert from UC San Diego to tell us more about his motivations for using the OptiCool and discuss a recent publication. Hi, this is uh, Richard Avert. I'm a professor in physics at UC San Diego, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about dynamics and control in quantum materials. And so this is a really um, exciting and emerging area where we're looking at a host of different quantum materials and we're using many different ways to try to manipulate and control their properties on demand. And what I'm going to focus on today is how we're doing that with short pulses of light. So what I'm going to do now is turn off my camera and get started on going over some of these uh, slides that talk about this idea. Okay, so basically this idea of properties on demand in quantum materials, as I mentioned, is a very rich area. And the idea is that we can take very various materials, uh, our properties of materials, and they're very sensitive to um, different types of perturbations. We could be talking about superconductivity, metal insulator transitions, uh, charge ordering, order orbital ordering, uh, topological properties. And the idea is that we can come in with different techniques, perhaps a magnetic field, we can manipulate the properties of that quantum material. We can um, also do things like use photo excitation to create metastable states. There's just a really a rich panoply of possibilities to manipulate these materials that are sensitive to perturbations. And you can learn a little bit more about that in um, these papers here. But what I said is I'm going to focus on basically how we do this with light for the most part. And so this brings us to this idea of photon-based dynamics and control in quantum materials. And the idea is quite simple. We take some short femtosecond pulse lasers. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and we have uh, one pulse that we call the pump pulse. And it initiates a change or drives dynamics in a system. And then we come in with a secondary pulse that's delayed in time with respect to that pump pulse to interrogate what has happened. And so we might measure a change in reflectivity or a change in transmission, and we can map out those dynamics. And the evolution of those dynamics, we could see some interesting things such as new properties emerge because of that uh, photo excitation, okay? Um, one of the things that's really happened in the past few years in photon-based dynamics control in quantum materials is that uh, there's been a lot of advances in lasers, and so we can do a lot of interesting things now, which means create short pulses that can be used to pump or drive uh, material, a quantum material, um, at, with various different wavelengths. For example, we might uh, use far infrared or terahertz pulses and you can have things like zener tunneling or carrier acceleration that can drive novel dynamics uh, a really particularly exciting area is uh, with the generation of mid infrared pulses we can basically drive phonons coherently and there's this whole interesting area of nonlinear phononics i'll say just a little bit more about that later um, another possibility is to dynamically drive magnons in various materials and of course we can also do um, excitation um, in the visible to drive things like uh, charge transfer transitions and maybe manipulate the properties by initiating dynamics with uh, a pump pulse such as that. Um, what's really neat about this, and we're still trying to figure out what we can do in terms of this on-demand control of quantum materials is to answer questions of, um, are these pump pulses mode selective? And, and, and the answer is yes, but to what extent? And that, what do I mean by that? Well, you want to pump a specific degree of freedom, and can you do that um, by the appropriate choice of wavelength? Um, are there multiple pathways to the same photo excited state? That's a question that we're still trying to answer. And and probably the most exciting thing is there are unique are there unique states that are accessible through the choice of the photon energy? So that's another one that another um, important. Um, concept that we're investigating. Now that was the pump, um, but the other thing that's happened is there's been an explosion in the past 10 years in terms of uh, that 
ability to probe uh, dynamics in quantum materials. And again, that the idea here is that we now have this ability to generate pulses across this whole large swath of electromagnetic spectrum. And so we can uh, you know, probe dynamics that were initiated by a pump pulse and by with pulses in the terahertz or the mid infrared, um, you know, using photo emission, using X-ray sources. And so the idea here is that if you look at, at, in the spectrum, you can see there's all these different excitations that are accessible. Um, and so that allows us to really try to understand the dynamics that we've induced in a material with these short pulses. Okay. Now within my lab, uh, we're doing uh, research on quite a number of different materials. I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to talk about all these today, but uh, we're looking um, at a lot of different transition metal oxides. And some of the sorts of things we're doing is we had one example where we were able to photo induce um, essentially uh, using light uh, metastable phase transition from um, essentially a charge ordered antiferromagnetic insulator to a ferromagnetic metal. That's something that we're still investigating. Another area that we've been doing work on is trying to manipulate and control superconductivity with light. Um, and we have some evidence that we've been able to do that using short pulses of light. Another area that we're very interested in is um, this idea of integrating little metamaterials, basically little sub-wavelength circuits with quantum materials and trying to look at the coupling between these resonators and the quantum material on which they're um, placed upon. Um, and then the last example, and the one that I'll actually talk about today in a little bit more detail, is this idea of dynamics control and anti-ferromagnetic mod insulators. Um, mod insulators, of course, are the parent compound of a lot of interesting materials, such as superconductors or materials that exhibit colossal magneto resistance, such as these. But the one I'm going to talk about today is a gadolinium titanate, where we do photo excitation and we're looking at how um, we might it might be possible to use light to manipulate the magnetization in this uh, particular system, which is, as I'll discuss in just a minute, a uh, very magnetic insulator. Okay, so as I mentioned, we've really um, looked at all, we are currently actually looking at a lot of different quantum materials using this um, idea of light-based manipulation. But the one I'm just gonna talk about today is really this idea of moving towards optomagnetic control of the ferry magnetic insulator gadolinium titanate. And one of the things I'll show you is that we can see interesting um, spin dynamics and we also see spin enhanced coherent acoustic phonons. And so over the next few minutes, let me just give you a, a, a little bit of a feel for this and tell you some of our results. I won't go into excruciating detail, but I'll at least try to give you a feel for some of these exciting ideas that can be uh, investigated using um, femtosecond pulses. And in this particular case, we're gonna actually do it in a magnetic field. Okay, so this is a very interesting and rich area and it's, so I, this, it's this area that's been termed optospintronics. Here's a nice review uh, paper that came out in 2018 on antiferromagnetic optospintronics. And there's a lot of interest in looking at dynamics and antiferromagnets. Uh, the idea being that if you can manipulate spins and antiferromagnets, that's actually quite interesting because you can do it on a much faster time scale potentially than in ferromagnets. And this, this review uh, article talks about some of the ideas here. And this is just a couple of examples just to kind of give you a feel for things. But uh, this is an example where in nickel oxide, where there's a magnon at terahertz frequencies and you come in with a short terahertz pulse, this red pulse has this spectral content shown here, and you basically coherently ping that magnon just as though you were ringing a bell. And then using Faraday rotation, you can see you know, this really long procession of the antiferromagnetic um, degree of freedom in the system with the Kerr Faraday rotation. And, and then here's another example where they use circularly polarized light to drive magnetization dynamics, where essentially the circularly polarized light acts as an effective magnetic field. And so this is a very exciting area that's uh, rich with uh, numerous possibilities. And this extends to other ideas that have been developed. And so um, there's these kind of exciting ideas of um, light based on demand control of magnetism based on nonlinear phenotics and flow K engineering. 
Uh, these two papers are a couple of uh, theory papers that give the idea, specifically in the titanates, of how to manipulate, uh, potentially, potentially manipulate the, the magnetism in these systems by driving phonons. And the idea of nonlinear phononics can kind of be captured in this, this little image here that's from this paper where you come in with a short pulse of light. This blue is given by the pulse envelope. And it's in the mid for infrared and it will drive a specific infrared active phonon and that infrared active phonon is coupled to a Raman active phonon and so this infrared active phonon the oscillations are given in green and this drive this coherent Raman phonon and so you have these oscillations but in addition to that you get a, a, what, what you might call a rectification of the lattice and so this change in the lattice structure by this coherent um, phonon excitation can there by change the properties of the material. So this idea of you manipulating the lattice and thereby the properties of the materials using coherent uh, infrared pulses is really an exciting idea. Um, another exciting idea is this idea of what has been termed flow K engineering. Um, in this case, you could think about this in a simple way is that you're actually gonna use non-resonant pulses and the, the very existence of that light on the system, you have this on, this, on a given material, you have this enhanced light matter interaction, and you, you might be able to do things like, by applying an electromagnetic field, modulate the exchange interactions in a solid. And, um, you know, for example, this little U here, I'm not gonna go into the details, has the electric field in it. And so you really literally, during the time that the pulse is present, you modify the exchange interactions. And so this shows a plot of the photon energy um, as a function of the field energy taken from this paper. And you can see that you actually, by choosing the right wavelength and the right field strength, you can actually manipulate um, materials um, and, and have them potentially go from being ferromagnetic to antiferromagnetic or vice versa. Okay, so that, that idea is explained in this paper here. And this is also um, particularly relevant to the titanates. Okay, these are, these are really neat ideas. Um, they are, uh, I would say, challenging, but um, we're beginning to try to work on these things to see if we can make some headway. And so the material that we've been looking at is uh, this gadolinium titanate. As I mentioned, this is a ferrimagnetic insulator, has a transition temperature of about 32 Kelvin. Now the TI, uh, the titanium three plus spins, they're ferromagnetically aligned along the C-axis, and they're antiferromagnetically coupled to the gadolinium. And the gadolinium has this huge moment of seven Bohr magnetons. And whereas the titanium on this 3D1 orbital basically has one Bohr magneton. And since they're antiferromagnetically coupled, when you saturate the magnetism, you have six Bohr magnetons to seven minus one. Um, so this is a really interesting, uh, the titanates are a really interesting class of materials. And you can kind of see this in this phase diagram here where uh, the rare earth ionic radius, as you change that, you can see this is the rare earth ionic radius here, and this is for different um, compounds. So if you have lanthanum, for example, you actually have uh, an anti-ferromagnetic system with uh, you know, a nail temperature of about 120 Kelvin. And as you change that ionic radius by changing that uh, rare earth, you see that you kind of get into this region where you have a crossover from anti-ferromagnetic behavior to ferromagnetic behavior. And that's, you know, shown here. Um, and this is all based on the fact that the tolerance factor are really, if you want to think about it, the lattice distortions, the octahedral tilts and rotations are changed by um, this substitution of the rare earth. And in particular, um, the gadolinium is pretty interesting because it's kind of right on the, it, it's as close as you can get without doing, um, you know, basically doping, uh, non-stoichiometric doping. But with the gadolinium, it's about as close as you can get in terms of being uh, between this ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic region. And so the idea is, okay, well, this particular material might then, since it's right on the boundary of these two different phases, um, be particularly amenable to manipulation, um, say by phonons or by flow K engineering, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, so we've been getting, uh, we've gotten single crystals of this material, and we've been starting to investigate its magnetic properties. Um, and so this, what I'm going to tell you about now, is um, this paper that was recently published on magnetoelastic coupling to coherent acoustic phonon modes in this material. Um, this is a nice collaboration that was led by a student in my group, D Dylan Lovinger, who's now 
um, graduated. Um, it's a collaboration with people at uh, UC Santa Barbara from where we got the crystal and also some theoretical input. And then also Soon J Moon, who helped us do these optical conductivity measurements that are shown right here. But the idea is the following. In this particular case, we're not really ready to do the phonon drive or the flow K drive. We kind of want to just begin to understand what are the magnetization dynamics in the system. So what we did is we came in with a short pulse that basically does an excitation across the Mott Hubbard gap as shown here with 1.8 EV pulses. And we know that that's the case because of these optical conductivity measurements here. So basically we're exciting right here where we have this um, basically, um, as I said, Mott Hubbard um, excitation for these T2G bands from the lower Hubbard band to the upper Hubbard band. And so we're gonna um, photo excite that transition, and then we're going to look at the dynamics. Um, but we, we wanna do this in a little bit more careful way. So um, we did these measurements with the experiment that's, that's shown here. I'm not gonna go into all, de all the details, but essentially we're measuring the photo-induced changes in reflectivity, and we call this delta R over R, and also the polar curve rotation dynamics of this gadolinium titanate. This uh, shows an example of, uh, of our setup. So we have an optical um, magnets capable of going down to 1.5 Kelvin and up to seven Tesla. And we have you know, a whole host of lasers that we use to generate those pump pulses I was telling you about earlier and these probe pulses. And we can just bring it into a conventional cryostat or with a couple of flipper mirrors, bring it into the optical. And in this particular experiment that I'm gonna show you, at least for the curve rotation dynamics, we actually came in through the top where the magnetic field is oriented perpendicular to the surface of the optical table. And we came in at normal incidence with our pump and probe beams, uh, near normal incidence. And so we're doing what's called polar curve rotation measurements. And um, yeah, so this is really gives us a lot of access to um, be able to very carefully investigate these pump probe dynamics as a function of both temperature and magnetic field. I'm gonna show you some of these results now. Uh, the first experiments we did were photo-induced changes in reflectivity. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but I'm just going to point out a few interesting things. This is the photo-induced change in reflectivity. Uh, you get a change of about, you know, maximum change on the order of, you know, two times uh, ten to the uh, minus two. Um, and what what's shown here is the dynamics as a function of temperature. This temperature scale here also maps onto the dynamics shown here. So this is a change in reflectivity as a function of time. And near room temperature, you just see exponential decay. And then what's interesting as you go to lower and lower temperatures, this you start to see a much larger signal and much longer dynamics, both in the rise time and, and then also in the decay time. In particular, the dynamics become extremely um, uh, slow right at the transition temperature. This is this particular curve here corresponds to, I think, about uh, 30 Kelvin. So that's right in the vicinity of the uh, of TC. Um, Without going into too much details, we've just plotted the peak change in reflectivity at 500 picoseconds as a function of temperature, and you see this large increase, and we've actually fit it with something that would be consistent with essentially having a magnetic signal, okay? Um, a delta R over R measurement is not a measure of the magnetization dynamics, but this is certainly telling you there's something that's happening right when you get into the vicinity of the, the transition to the fairy magnetic order or state. And one other thing I'd like to point out that you can't see too clearly here is that there's also some weak oscillations on top of this data. These are what are called coherent acoustic phonons. I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Actually, I'll come back to that in, on the next slide. I'll just show you real quickly uh, some of the, the, the dynamics. I'll just break these dynamics down just a little bit more for you before we go into the curve measurements. And so um, the photo and Reduce reflectivity dynamics. Uh, what happens is um, a lot of new dynamics emerge when we get into that fairy, ma fairy magnetic order state. And this is just kind of a cartoon showing you some of what can happen. You know, above, above, well, out of the uh, magnetic order region at 100 Kelvin, you just see these little oscillations, and you see essentially a, a fast exponential relaxation with a long time offset. Um, it's very short. You know, picosecond time scale is just a, what we call electron phonon relaxation. That initial 
electron distribution that was excited is thermalizing with the lattice via emission of phonons. But what's interesting is when you get into that fairy magnetic ordered state, all these new time scales which correspond to new dynamics pop up. Um, so we see things related to electron photon coupling that I already mentioned, uh, orbital ordering dynamics, spin lattice ordering dynamics, and other sorts of dynamics. Okay, And so the basic idea here is um, new dynamics emerge upon approaching TC. Um, and the one thing that is interesting, remember I mentioned these little wiggles, we've extracted those, and I'm showing that on, a, on this curve here, and you have to look at this a little, a, little, a little bit carefully. This is the change in reflectivity as a function of time at these different temperatures. And you know these kind of reddish curves are all well above the transition temperature. And you kind of see this coherent oscillation. Okay, it's a little bit chirped and it has some interesting features, but it doesn't change so much. But then what happens is when you start to get into the magnetically ordered region, you see that amplitude increases by quite a bit. And so this really shows that these coherent acoustic phonons um, basically are enhanced uh, once you get into the spin ordered state. Okay, So there's all these suggestive things that are occurring um, in these reflectivity dynamics, but as I mentioned, these are just suggestive that interesting dynamics are occurring as you approach the magnetically ordered state in this very magnetic insulator. But to really then look at that in more detail, you have to go do um, a magnetization measurement. So that's what I'm going to show you on the following slides in terms of these polar curve rotation measurements that we did in the magnetic field using the optical. Okay, so now um, I'm just going to describe to you these uh, polar curve rotation dynamics. These are the measurements where we basically measure the, you know, um, the photo-induced change in the polarization rotation, and you know, for Faraday and curve rotation, you know, this is proportional to the changes in the magnetization. Again, we are measuring the change in the rotation that's caused by uh, doing this photo excitation. And the way we do these measurements, actually, what's shown in all this data here, is we do the measurements at plus h plus magnetic field and we subtract off the measurements that we do it uh, uh, equal and oppositely directed magnetic field and this way you can ensure that you have mag you know true magnetization dynamics. Um, so what I'm showing you here is that photo induced change in uh, curve rotation, you know, this is sitting on top. Of, we, we, we measure the static curve rotation. This is the change about whatever value you're at at a given temperature. So this is, again, the change in the curve rotation. And so what I'm showing you here is the photo-induced change in curve rotation as a function of time at various fields. This data here is at 0.1 tesla. This is at 0.25 tesla. This is at half a tesla. And this is at one tesla. And we did this for various different temperatures. So let's, let's look at this data um, a little bit. Uh, and we'll actually start look at considering at low temperature. So if we look at the low temperatures, what we see is an increase, this core, this positive, this delta theta corresponds to an increase in the magnetization. Then as you go to uh, up to close to TC, you now see that you have first an increase in the magnetization and then a decrease in the magnetization. And the closer you get to, you know, in the vicinity of TC or slightly above it even, the sooner you have that crossover from an increase in magnetization to a decrease in magnetization. Now what's interesting is then when you go to a higher magnetic field, you see similar dynamics. The amplitude has increased a little bit. Um, but you again see this behavior that when you get close to TC, there's this crossover from an increase in magnetization to a decrease. And, and um, that time gets pushed out further. That's a little bit more pronounced here at the half Tesla data, where now you can see that the crossover from an increase in magnetization to a decrease occurs at something like 400 um, picoseconds. And then when we get to this uh, highest field that we use in this particular experiment of one Tesla, we see that this uh, polar curve rotation signal, you know, this photo-induced change is always positive. So there's always an increase in magnetization. We never see at any time or at any temperature uh, a de decrease in the magnetization. So this is actually um, uh, quite interesting and we think we have at least a preliminary interpretation of that and I'm showing you that on this slide. This is again the same data I just showed to you a second ago. Um, so this is just a little cartoon to give you some feel for what 
is possibly going on where we have the, the ma applied magnetic field along the axis of this crystal and then at t equals zero we come in with a short pulse of light and remember this excitation is across the mott hubbard gap and it so it really is a t2g to t2g excitation so you're really kind of driving the initial dynamics in the titanium channel and so um, at short time scales really you've put the energy into the titanium um, orbitals and so the first thing you can have is uh, basically photo induced changes in the magnetization of the titanium and remember the gadolinium moment shown by these blue arrows and the titanium by the red arrows are antiferromagnetically coupled so what that means is if you reduce the uh, moment of the titanium along the a-axis you're essentially going to have the situation where like what we see at low fields where um, there's first an increase in the magnetization followed by a, a decrease in the magnetization when energy that was initially in the titanium spins then through some sort of spin lattice coupling or or you know exchange interactions gets into the gadolinium okay and so that would account for this fact that at first in this region here you see this increase in magnetization as you decrease the titanium moment but then you finally get an overall decrease in the magnetization when you start to decrease also the at longer time scales the the, the, the magnetization associated with the gadolinium moments now um, this is also consistent with this idea that when you get to higher fields you see this same sort of behavior at first but now um, with these higher fields the gadolinium moment is really kind of you know much more rigidly aligned along the uh, applied magnetic field so you only see an increase in the magnetization associated with essentially the decrease of the the um, titanium moment along the h-axis so this is kind of the idea that you know we kind of see this coupling between the gadolinium and the titanium moments in these polar Kerr measurements and this is just something that you would not be able to interpret from the delta r over r measurements and the ability to have this magnetic field um, to kind of look at this very carefully as a, a function of applied field is a, is very important in terms of being able to understand uh, what the Kerr rotation um, dynamics tell us about how the magnetization of the system evolves. And one of the things you can also see on this data again is you still see these coherent oscillations associated with coherent acoustic photons. And so we took off, we, we extracted also this, um, this, this um, coherent signal from the Kerr rotation dynamics. And you see very similar behavior as what I showed you in the delta R over R. Um, and this is interesting because this is in the in the Kerr rotation. And again, uh, well above the transition temperature, you see kind of these coherent phonons that become much more pronounced and enhanced when you get into the fairy magnetic ordered phase. And so this really um, shows you uh, basically that these coherent these coherent acoustic phonons, you know, in the Kerr signal, they really provides definitive evidence of magnetoelastic coupling. And, you know, and overall these Kerr dynamic measurements have provided us some interesting information between uh, about the coupling between the titanium and gadolinium spins. And so this really sets the stage now that we have a understanding of what happens when you change the magnetization in the system in terms of what the Kerr signatures are. This really sets the stage for doing measurements like um, you know, these phononic or flow K magnetization studies, which are somewhat harder, but now we have uh, some better understanding of the material, so we're well prepared to go and try and um, do those measurements. And so I think this is just one example where you have to very carefully uh, plan the experiments in a stepwise fashion to go towards these really um, exciting ideas, which is, is, is where we're headed. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this presentation. I thank you for taking the time to listen to it. And so really in summary, I hope I, 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 hope I showed um, you know, a little bit about this idea that light-based dynamics and control um, really provides a fertile ground for exploring quantum materials and, and really non-equilibrium dynamics in these really fascinating materials. And so in gadolinium titanate, I showed you that we, you know, we observe spin dynamics exhibiting clear signatures of gadolinium titanium coupling. Um, and we also saw through this uh, Kerr measurements that there's clear magnetoelastic coupling that's manifested in this, um, you know, changes in the coherent acoustic phonons when you hit the transition temperature with the spin ordering.
Um, we've been doing other measurements in a magnetic field using the optical, and we have some really interesting results on uh, both topological and Kataya of quantum materials. So we're very excited about those, and you know, um, we're, we're trying to understand what we've measured. And so hopefully in the not too distant future, I'll be able to make another presentation to, to, to inform you of um, what those results are. And so thank you for your time. Let's continue by highlighting some more of the features offered by Optical. While the experiments described by Professor Averett utilize the top window, which has a large numerical aperture of 0.7, Optical also has seven side ports, each with an NA of 0.11. A little later in the webinar, the research described by the Stern Group at Northwestern will utilize the side windows in their experiments. Here's a schematic and cross-sectional view of the optical highlighting some of the critical components. The operating temperature range offered by the optical is 350 Kelvin down to a base temperature of 1.7 Kelvin. Naturally, if the intended experiment uses a very high optical pump laser, then the base temperature could be affected. The system comes standard with an auxiliary user thermometer which can be placed very near the sample. The magnetic field, which is always vertical, is supplied by a split coil conical superconducting magnet. The maximum field is 7 Tesla. Both temperature and field control are fully automated and programmable, similar to our other measurement platforms you may be familiar with. The optical was designed to minimize vibrations, which may be critical for experiments which rely on a highly focused laser beam or some form of microscopy. The lateral vibrations are less than 10 nanometers and less than 4 nanometers in the vertical Z direction, as measured by a capacitive displacement sensor. Those of you who have used the PPMS product line are familiar with the sample puck. Optical utilizes a sample pod, which is designed to be easily removable and configurable by the end user. Furthermore, the sample pod includes 16 pre-installed wires for conventional DC transport. Unlike the PPMS product line in which helium exchange gas can be used to thermalize the sample, the optical sample chamber is in a very high vacuum and therefore the sample is only cooled by conduction and must be thermally anchored to the sample pod. In contrast to the PPMS product line, optical allows for a very large 89mm by 84mm sample volume to accommodate a wide variety of potential experimental setups. As will be shown later, the sample volume can be considerably expanded in the vertical direction. Here is Jovan Nelson from the Stern Group at Northwestern to tell us more about what they have been doing with their Optical. Hello. In this presentation, we will cover work that has been done in the Stern Group at Northwestern University, namely probing span dynamics in indium solenoid with time-resolved curve rotation. The roadmap we will follow is one, motivating studying the spin degree of freedom in semiconductors. Two, benefits of conducting spin control on layered semiconductors. Three, apparatus and sample considerations needed to study spin properties in indium solenoid. And finally, experimental verification of predicted spin dependent optical selection rules in indium solenoid. The spin degree of freedom is a fundamental property of an electron. Spins have an up-down nature and little energy is needed to switch between these states, which is advantageous for computation. This ultimately makes spin appealing for transporting and storing information. To control the spin degree of freedom, we need a knob. So just like we can use electric fields to control the charge degree of freedom of an electron, we can use magnetic fields to control the spin. Together, we gain an enhanced control over solid state systems. Now examples of such systems will be given later. But first, let's talk briefly about what tools or methods we can actually use to manipulate the spin. In general, there are two main methods of magnetic manipulation. Magnets, typically ferromagnets, which can be controlled with current or external fields to switch between spin states. This tends to be favorable because they can be integrated into devices. However, they also tend to be static and slow. Another method is circularly polarized light. 
This can allow us to select spin states with one of the circular helicities. The advantage of this method is that we can do dynamic and fast switching between spin states. And in this presentation, we will focus on utilizing this intriguing knob. A quintessential piece to our ability to couple light to spin is a spin orbit interaction. This interaction leads to the splitting of solid state bands and materials like gallium arsenide. They also help facilitate and influence spin polarized optical selection rules. And these optical selection rules allow us to control spin states in these materials. And with this control over spin, spin based technologies have been created and studied with classic materials such as 3 5 semiconductors. This includes optical spin transport, optical spin memory, and optical spin coherence. However, 3-5 semiconductors are not the only interesting platforms for spin-based devices. Layered, or 2D semiconductors, are another class of materials that are interesting for spin manipulation. In general, 2D materials are thin and flexible, thus easy to integrate into devices. They are also stackable, thus we can build structures layer by layer, which allows for interesting opportunities to exploit electronic and magnetic phenomena. The canonical 2D materials for spin manipulation are the transition monocalcogenides, or TMDs. These materials are at the center of the field of valleytronics. These systems have valleys, which are separated in case space. These pseudo-spin states can be accessed by one of the helicities of circularly polarized light, and these can be designed to be analogous to spintronics. The spin states are also stuck in a particular valley, which could have applications for information storage. However, this spin valley locking, as it's called, limits our ability to dynamically manipulate spin between spin states, which has been an advantage for 3.5 devices some of which were mentioned before. So we can ask a question. Is there a 2D material without spin valley locking and more analogous to 3-5 semiconductors? Indium solenite is a layered material that has been predicted to have spin polarized optical selection rules near the gamma point. This means that it has a direct band gap selection rules no spin valley locking, therefore a closer parallel to 3-5 semiconductors. On top of this, indium solenite has been experimentally demonstrated to have a layer-dependent band gap, high electron mobility, and interesting transport properties. And when we take these all together, we can see that indium solenite is a potential platform for future spin-based devices. Thus, the objective of this work is to demonstrate or verify polarized dependent optical selection rules in layered indium solenite. What's needed to accomplish this is one, a viable sample for the experiment, two, a spin sensitive experimental setup, and three, we have to experimentally establish optically induced spin polarization. So, first, let's start with an overview of indium solenite. Indium solenite is a group 3 monocalcogenide. These materials have four main stacking polytypes, which determine crystal symmetry. Crystal symmetry determines strength of spin splitting, or spin over coupling. These class of materials are predicted to have spin over coupling for the monolayer, as well as the sigma, gamma, and epsilon bulk, as well as for restricted cases of the beta bulk. And for these particular cases, they, they are predicted to have sizable spin splitting which is needed for effective coupling between polarized light and spin. Another property of indium solenite that must be considered is its environmental instability. This can be tracked with photoluminescence over time. Here's a plot showing the degradation of thin indium solenite under one milliwatt of green light. 
The blue curve is a degradation of the sample in ambient, green in vacuum, and red at 10 Kelvin. This highlights indium solanized air sensitivity. Therefore, preparation of thin layers must be in an inert environment like a nitrogen glove box. This solves some problems. However, indium solanide also degrades in solutions like chloroform, which is used to fabricate devices. Now, there has been work done by groups like the Hurston Group at Northwestern, where they present potential solutions to this problem. But for simplicity, bulk is used in this work because of its slow degradation, its large size, and that spin polarization should still persist. To actually probe these spin properties in indium solenite, we can use a true and tried method, timer solve curve rotation. Using a femtosecond pulse laser, we can create two beams, a pump and a probe. These two pulses can be separated in time, which we can control with a mechanical delay line. First, the circularly polarized pump is incident on the sample at a photon energy near the band edge for bulk indium solenite. These energies are accessible by a tie staff laser. If spin polarization is possible with light, the pump should excite a spin orientation into the conduction. When this occurs, the system is knocked out of equilibrium, and this creates changes to the index of refraction. After the pump, a linear probe is then incident on the sample. This will track the changes due to spin asymmetry in the system through the rotation of its linear polarization, or curve rotation, as a function of time. Thus, we can be very sensitive to spin polarization in the system. Another crucial component to perform these experiments is a magnetal optical cryostat that can be used with free space optics. Quantum Design has designed the optical in which we are beta testing. It is accessible by a pulse laser, can cool samples to about 1.5 Kelvin, as well as give access to high magnetic field. On the right is a picture of our setup to utilize this system with our pulse lasers. The top right image is a picture of our long focal length lens used to focus our beams on samples. Here is a top view image where we have a homemade mounting structure which allows us to use the side window. With this system and our timer resolve cur setup, we have the ability to do low temperature magneto optical experiments, which are crucial to our ability to study spin dynamics in materials like indium solenite. This is a picture of the bulk indium solenite measure. The large flake and gold marker above it makes conducting these pump probe measurements easier. And here is the data from this sample. The y-axis represents the rotation of the linearly polarized probe, or curve rotation, and the x-axis is the time separation between the pump and the probe, labeled as time delay. The green dotted curve represents generating a spin orientation in the system with one helicity a circularly polarized light, which will decay since the system is being pumped into a non-equilibrium state. Now when the opposite helicity of light is used, the signal is flipped, which occurs because we are inducing the other spin orientation, shown in the red dotted curve. And when linearly polarized light is used, the signal is quenched because equal amounts of spin up and spin down electrons are being excited in the system, which is shown by the blue curve. This clearly demonstrates the optical orientation in bulk indium solenide. Now these experiments were done with a photon energy of roughly 1.305 electron volts, which is where the signal is maximized. On the right is a heat map of the curve spectrum. The y-axis marks the photon energy, the x-axis the time delay, while the color represents the strength of the curve signal and it can be seen that the signal is maximized somewhere between 1.3 electron volts and 1.31 electron volts. Since spin polarization has been established, it would also be good to know if we can get another favorable property, and that is precession of spin in a magnetic field. This is important as this would distinguish indium solenite from TMDs, which do not have this property, and make it more analogous to 3,5 semiconductors, which do have this property. The experiment is depicted in the left image. When spin is oriented perpendicular to an external magnetic field, it should process in this field. This experiment is done using the optical superconducting magnet. The image on the right is experimental data at 6 tesla, 
and it shows short-lived but clear oscillations for both helicities of light and indium selenide. What this experimentally demonstrates is that spins are not locked to valleys as they are in TMDs. This gives further evidence that because indium selenide has direct band gap selection roles, it is a closer parallel to 3-5 semiconductors. So to conclude, the outlook of this work can be seen in that spin and electronic properties of indium selenide offer another platform for building spin-based devices. We can generate spin polarization and observe spin precession in bulk indium selenide. These initial fundamental studies then can be stepping stones to further understand spin dynamics in this system. Taking a moment to acknowledge those who have contributed to this work in the Stern Group, Mercek, REU, and the Mark Herson Group, as well as acknowledgments to the funding sources that have made this work possible. Thank you for listening. Wrapping up with some of the latest optical developments, which have been focused on expanding the versatility of the sample pod. For example, the large volume sample pod allows one to utilize a significant amount of space below the magnet center line, and is quite useful if one wants to accommodate tall positioner stages. We have also developed specialized wiring to drive a wide range of available positioners. Additionally, many experiments also require a high NA objective, to address this need, we also offer a field-compatible Zeiss Infinity Corrected Objective with an NA of 0.75 and a free working distance of 2 mm between your sample and the cold shield aperture. The optics are maintained in vacuum and at room temperature. Finally, RF coax lines allowing measurements up to 20 GHz can be added and use standard RF connections at the feed-through and sample pod. In summary, as a function of increasing measurement frequency, I briefly introduced the various magnetic characterization tools we offer at Quantum Design. In particular, I focused on our broadband FMR capabilities, and we also heard from a couple of early adopters to Optical about their research on novel quantum materials at picosecond timescales. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have at this time.